In the name of God, most merciful, ever merciful, and may God's peace and blessings be upon his holy prophet Muhammad and the purified members of his household and progeny. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil farajahum. Brothers, sisters, and uh, respected viewers in general, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to this uh, third installment of uh, our series on uh, the big topic or the big theme of uh, the afterlife. So what happens to us from the moment of death and onwards. Uh, and uh, until now we have uh, covered two of the lessons in our curriculum. The first one really had to do with trying to understand the importance of the topic, uh, the relevance of the topic for our, say, even daily lives and the manner in which in the worldview that we have, depending on how a human being is going to view the, uh, you know, the topic of afterlife, uh, what happens to a human being after they die, this is going to be what will direct and orient all of their actions and give meaning to uh, everything you decide to do or not to do in life in general. Uh, and all of this will depend on the answers that you're going to try to, to give yourself to uh, the big questions related to death and afterwards. What is there a life after death? And what type of relationship exists between this world and the next world and so on and so forth. And so in the last uh, time that we met, um, the topic really had to do with uh, beginning to try to understand the soul. Uh, and as we said, depending on our understanding of the soul, the relationship, first of all, whether it exists or not, and then the relationship between the soul and the body, uh, you are going to have a very different understanding of the afterlife. So the topic of the soul becomes very important. And that's why in this case, in this specific curriculum, uh, the author has decided to actually begin the discussion on the afterlife once that he's established the importance of the topic. He began the discussion with the topic of the soul. Uh, and if you remember in the first part of the series, we said, you know, there's a number of topics that we're going to go through. Uh, and one of them is the soul. Uh, at times, in different, uh, depending on the curriculum, depending on the book that you're following, uh, the soul is always discussed, but at times it's discussed at the end uh, or somewhere in the middle. In this case, the author decided to begin with it. Uh, and uh, it's a smart and logical move on his part because if this part is not well established yet, uh, it's going to be very problematic to continue with the other topics. So, uh, as we said, it was a first part, a first initial discussion surrounding the, the soul that we had. And today, inshallah, it's going to be the second part of that discussion and the last part of that discussion related to the soul. Uh, for the next, for the rest of the series, we're going to need what we're saying here. And we are going to talk about the soul here and there, but not directly in the manner in which we're, we're doing right now. So uh, this topic is, this uh, lesson is actually called the immateriality of the soul or the non-materiality of the soul. But, you know, as you probably noticed, the, the first time we talked about the soul as well, the last time, uh, it really had to do with the immateriality of the soul as well. So the topic was introduced uh, and a first, uh, you know, argument was presented for the immateriality of the soul. Uh, and today we are going to build on that and continue uh, with that, inshallah. So the manner in which the lesson is constructed is that following a quick introduction in which the author basically reminds us what we've covered until now because he needs to build on it, uh, we jump into the arguments for establishing uh, the existence and the independence of a soul and a soul being an immaterial, uh, I'm going to call it for now, uh, and the immaterial part of our being. Uh, but that said, you know, we're going to see that uh, this is not the most uh, accurate description that we can give to the soul. Uh, and then, so once he, he presents the, some of the rational arguments that we have for the immateriality of the soul, then he moves on to provide what we can refer to as the scriptural evidence or some proofs and uh, evidence from the Holy Quran here and there to show that 
what we're saying here actually uh, has been supported fully by the Holy Quran that establishes those same truths. But in this case, now we're talking about it from a more scriptural sense. So uh, not necessarily just relying on, on reason and, and philosophy, say. So uh, in terms of an introduction, um, we began this series by saying that if your understanding of the soul uh, is going to be in one way or another, it may severely impact the way you understand the afterlife. In fact, in certain variants or in certain interpretations of the soul, you may end up not being able to even have an afterlife. So it depends on what you're going to answer to the questions related to the soul, your understanding of the afterlife, the type of relationship you're going to have with your future self, the, the self of uh, yourself that is going to exist after you die. Uh, a lot of this is going to depend on what type of soul do you imagine having. So hence the importance of this topic and uh, why the, the author tells us that we need to spend a little bit of time understanding the reality of the soul, our relationship to the soul, our, you know, again, uh, I'm using very loosely the language here, uh, because as we will see, the soul is in fact us and us, we are the soul. Uh, but let's say our relationship to the soul, uh, because we sometimes get uh, confused, it becomes ambiguous because the one that we see the part of ourselves that we see is this body. Uh, and because of that, we kind of forget about the soul, we neglect it or we view it as something secondary or maybe even equal to the body. And we'll see that uh, it's more important than that. So hence the importance of understanding this topic so that we have a proper entry into the topic of the afterlife. So what we've established until now uh, is that first of all, the soul exists, one, and two, it exists in a manner that uh, allows it to remain. Remain in the sense that if this body were not to exist anymore, then that soul can remain in existence. And we need both of these uh, kind of sub sub uh, topics into the soul. So we need to establish that it exists and we need to establish that it is a type of entity that can remain in existence even though it is not attached to a physical body, a corporeal entity. Okay, so with, for all of this, we basically said that the soul is an independent existent, something that exists independently of the body, uh, but it does exist. So we need to, those two things. It's, it exists and it exists or it can exist independently. So we also, because that's the manner in which we build that argument, we also said that uh, the soul is the identity. So we can use the term identity in two different ways. Uh, the argument that we presented in the last time was basically that if we look at a human being, we're going to see that uh, the body of the human being is going to undergo a tremendous amount of change from the time it enters into this world until the time it leaves. To the point where we could even say, you know, that there's not much of the human being that remains the same, especially if we take into consideration the fact that, you know, every cell in your body is dying at some point and being replaced at some point. Uh, so what really is holding all of you together in the sense that allows you to say that you are still the same person? So that's what we mean by identity. It's this unity. What allows you to say that you are one unit, despite the fact that if I look at you now and I look at you in 50 years, uh, you may be physically, you know, if we were to really go in, you know, at a microscopic level or smaller, we would see that you are no longer the same entity. So what allows me to say that you are still you? So the, the I, where is the I coming from when the physical body uh, in which you seem to reside is changing to this point? <clears throat> so the answer to this was the soul. That's what allows you to uh, say that there is an identity. And of course, we said, uh, and the author was right in this, that if you want to take a more positivist or a more materialist uh, perspective to try to answer this question, then there is no real answer. And if you go to the uh, writings of the more recent, you know, the big materialists of the world today, and, you know, they also happen to be the biggest uh, proponents of atheism, 
uh, they're very open in, in saying that uh, you know, this idea that we have about consciousness and free will and all those things that you associate with the I uh, when you talk about yourself, your identity, uh, these are all illusions. They don't really exist because you cannot really attribute those things to matter itself. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, there, there's kind of a consensus on this when, when you read their works. In any case, so what we established until now is that there's a soul, so it exists, and that it exists, it can exist independently, therefore it can remain after this body has, has passed and has decomposed and has died. Uh, and that this is the entity, this part that remains, that exists and that remains, is what allows you to say, one, that you are the same despite all the changes that occur, one. And two, uh, it is what, who you really are. Who you really are is not reduced to your body. Who you really are is that soul not the body okay so this is what we established until now based on what we presented in the last lesson or the, the last lecture so in a sense in a way uh, we could say that uh, the author's strategy initially until now has been more to establish kind of an argument by the negative to say that uh, you know this is what we are not so we are not the material uh, corporeal body that we see we are more than that the soul is more than that it is an independent immaterial reality so you know just to, to understand kind of what we're trying to do in terms of the argumentation another way to view it is to simply say that he presented one argument until now uh, one big argument uh, and that today we are going to try to establish this much further uh, by presenting more arguments to clearly establish that the soul is actually an immaterial entity that exists and that can remain in existence even after this body has decomposed. And this will be done through two main means, uh, which is one side, the rational discourse and the rational arguments for this, and on the other side, the scriptural. And here the author is simply going to look at a few verses of the Holy Quran. There are many, many others uh, that we could have uh, looked at that also refer to the soul directly or indirectly, but from which we can also uh, conclude that there's definitely a soul that exists. And so the author doesn't do that. And we also are not going to be looking at the entire corpus of hadith, the, the, the narrations from the Holy Prophet and Ahl al-Bayt about this topic. Otherwise, you know, it would, uh, it would take uh, many more lectures, but uh, needless to say, there is a lot of uh, hadith that can be referred to here. And that will definitely enrich this topic if we wanted to, to look at them. So, you know, I encourage you to, uh, to look into those. So if we begin with trying to look at the soul from a, uh, from a rational point of view. I think we began to talk about this a little bit the last time we met. And we said that this is a topic that has been discussed and researched uh, extensively. Uh, in Islamic theology and Islamic philosophy. Uh, and so anyone who wants to go back and look at the works, there is a lot that can be covered. And there are many, many points of view, many, many theories that have been presented. Uh, what we're presenting here today, I hope to present it in the, in the most, let's, let's call it generic way, so that the person who's receiving it can say, I have kind of like a, a good appreciation of the classic presentation. Uh, but once you go into the details, you'll see that there are different points of view, that there's different uh, uh, philosophies, and obviously each one of them is going to lead you into a, a slight variation of what we're presenting today in terms of the type of argumentation that you have. So putting all of that aside, again, as a reminder, you know, we're just uh, presenting this as an introductory level so that we know what's out there and we have the basic uh, arguments that we need. Uh, at the level of an introductory course to Islamic beliefs. Otherwise, the details are to be found in more uh, advanced works. So, the argument. Before we jump into the argument, the author tells us, look at uh, yourself. Look at what you consider to be yourself and start looking at, for instance, your body. 
if you look at your skin, if you touch yourself, let's say you touch the, you know, you feel the bones, the joints, you feel the muscles, you feel the tissue, you feel the hair, you see yourself. Uh, this is one way to, to view yourself, to experience yourself. And then there's another way to experience yourself, which is when you think about who you are, when you think about that, the fact that do you exist, do you feel yourself existing or not? Do you feel that you are aware or not? Do you feel that you go through certain, uh, here I refer to them as kind of psychological states. Do you recognize that you have an I? When you say I, you know what you're talking about. Do you feel the existence of that thing? Do you feel yourself, do you experience yourself thinking, doubting, questioning, feeling anger, feeling sad, feeling tired? When you go through these uh, states, as you experience them, the author tells us there is going to be a difference between that experience and your experience of, say, when you look at yourself or when you, uh, let's say, you touch your skin or you feel the texture of your skin or your hair or, you know, when you have a bodily experience of yourself. And the big difference here is obviously that in one case, the manner in which you understand and view yourself is going through the intermediary of your body. Your body itself is a medium through which you're experiencing your body. So in order to know that I have a body, I could, you know, see it, I could feel it, I could touch it, I could taste it, right? So you're using your five senses to experience the body. So that's one way to understand yourself. So this is starting just from you, not going any further than yourself. And then if you look at the other set of experiences of yourself, you see that they're not going through the bodily experience, that you know that you exist, that you experience your own existence, or that you're, you experience your own consciousness, your awareness, or that your feeling, for instance, your, your feeling of anger or your feeling of happiness or the fact that you know that you're thinking right now. When you look at these states, so let's call them psychological states, states of your I, you know that they do not go through your, the intermediary of your body. You have a direct experience of those things. And if you remember, this is a topic that we've addressed, that we've talked about uh, at times in more or less detail, this is the difference between the mediated knowledge that you may have about anything, including yourself or the world, versus the immediate, so non-mediated type of knowledge that you may have. So in certain cases, you have a type of knowledge that is acquired or theoretical, or that you have an image of something. You have an image of, because this is what you're getting through your senses, so you're able to extract an image of it, an understanding of it. And this is different from uh, the direct experience that you have of yourself as, say, an identity, an entity that exists or that thinks or that doubts, for instance. And so this already tells us that there are two parts, two ways of viewing yourself and therefore two parts to you. And if you look at the manner in which doubt applies to those two types of existence, two types of experiencing your existence, you'll see that it doesn't apply in the same way. So anything that you're experiencing through the senses is something that you could potentially doubt, that you could potentially question. And this applies to anything and everything that you experience in the real world out there, as well as yourself. Because you're relying on your senses, there's always a possibility that you're going to say, for instance, I'm looking at myself and, you know, maybe there's a defect with my eye that's making me see myself in a certain way. And so I may doubt it. Or when I touch and I feel a certain texture, I'm not sure. Maybe there is something already on my skin on this side that makes me feel the texture of the skin on that other side in a certain way. And so I have to see whether there is something or not. And so you know that the senses could trick you. You know that you could doubt those. Whereas if you go on the other side and you, if you look at those direct experiences that you have of yourself, the fact that you exist, the fact that you're thinking, for instance, or certain psychological states that you're in, you're not going to doubt that. 
you know, you may doubt how you qualify it, but your direct experience of it, not, not, not the afterwards thinking that you're trying to impose on it and use to analyze, but the direct experience of it, this is a direct immediate experience that is not right or wrong, it just is, and therefore it's not open to mistakes, right? You're, the thing in itself, the, whatever you're experiencing, is present to you directly. You're experiencing it in presence. It's not something that you're getting an image of, right? And this is the difference between, as we've explained in the past, in Arabic it's referred to as ilm husuli. So this is an acquired knowledge. This is what you get through any type of mediation, an intermediary between you and that type of knowledge, versus ilm huduri, something that is present to you in itself. Okay, so you're experiencing it as opposed to trying to theorize and imagine what it is. Okay, these are two types of knowledge that we have as human beings. And if you take them and apply them to yourself, you're going to see that, again, this is going to allow you to say there are things that you can doubt about yourself, but there are other things that you cannot doubt about yourself. And, you know, for those of you who have studied uh, philosophy, you know that some philosophers have have allowed themselves to build an entire philosophical system because they wanted to build a system based on a sound and strong and uh, solid foundation, they began with doubt. If you think about René Descartes, for instance, his entire philosophical system begins with doubt. You know, they refer to it as Cartesian doubt. Okay, so basically I'm going to doubt everything. But even if I wanted to doubt everything, there are things that I cannot doubt. For instance, I cannot doubt that I am doubting. Therefore, I cannot doubt that I'm thinking. And this was his cogito ergo sum, right? I think, therefore I am. If I am thinking, I must exist. If I'm doubting, it means I'm thinking. It means I exist in order to be able to think. So there, no matter how much you want to doubt, no matter how much you want to question, there are things that become impossible to question. And so when you look at yourself, when you look at yourself as a entity, as a full entity in, in all of your complexity, you're going to see that no matter how much you want to doubt certain things about yourself, there are others that you cannot doubt at all. You have a direct experience of them, you know they're there, right? And maybe just a quick uh, side note here, uh, I, I simply mentioned Descartes because, you know, the, his name uh, crossed my mind as I'm, as I'm talking about this. The, the truth is, because we're in this type of, uh, of lecture or, or setting, you know, it's unfortunate in our world we think that he's kind of the, the first, especially in the, we, we study Western philosophy. And uh, if you go back to the works of Ibn Sina, uh, who was writing before him some 600 more years, uh, you'll see that he talked about all of this. And this is, in fact, one of the ways how Ibn Sina proves the existence of the soul, the immateriality of the soul. Uh, and the difference and this application of doubt. What can you doubt and what can't you doubt? Okay, so just uh, something to keep in mind, you know, when they think that he was the first to use doubt in this manner. No, there are some uh, Islamic philosophers who used it, you know, centuries and centuries before him uh, in the same manner and perhaps even with more, uh, uh, more technical accuracy than he did because some philosophers afterwards came to, to what Descartes said and kind of criticized what he said. In any case, so keeping in mind that this is how we experience ourselves, then we have, uh, we have the I. So this was me looking at everything together, but what about that fundamental part of me that is who I really am? Where does this fall into? What, what can I say about that? And this is where the author wants to establish, where it wants to anchor his entire argumentation about the immateriality of the soul. So he's going to say, just looking at this I, so not this I, but I as an identity, uh, this is going to allow me to see that there is an immaterial component that is my true I, that allows me to say I, and that is going to allow me to see that it is immaterial and that it exists. Okay, so this is the rational argumentation to prove the immateriality of the soul. The first argument we have is that the I is experienced directly. You experience yourself directly. You experience your body through the intermediary of your body. But imagine yourself, as some philosophers have asked us to do, 
including Ibn Sina, they have said, imagine yourself as floating and then imagine yourself losing the body. Could you potentially, if you were to do this experiment, let's call it a philosophical, theoretical experiment, could you imagine yourself existing without a body? Yes, you could. And could you still remain there without the body? Yes, you could. And so this is not presented in this manner directly in this lesson, but this is kind of one of the main arguments that's presented in classic philosophy. And so here the author is telling us your direct experience of your eye. Do you feel that it falls under the part that is intermediated through the body? Or can you really get rid of the body in your experience, just put the body on the side and still know that you exist as an entity? And if you can do that, then therefore that tells you that who you really are is different from your body. These are two different things. And because the body constitutes everything that you are, what remains is some immaterial part of you, and that is who you really are, and that is the immaterial soul that exists within each one of us. So that's kind of the first argument to prove the existence of the soul. The second argument that we're pre uh, presented with is that despite all of the changes, so this brings us back to what we presented in the last lesson, if we look at all the changes that happen to ourselves, so I only look at myself, and this is a twist from the last lecture, is that I still know, I still feel and experience that I am still the same entity despite all the changes that have occurred. So I know that my body is changing. In fact, I could maybe feel the same, but when I look at an image, let's say, you know, 50 years before, and I see, for instance, that I had a lot more hair or that I looked different, I have a lot more white beard, for instance, whatever it may be, the changes that have occurred, I feel that I'm still the same entity. When I look at myself, I may feel that I'm very, very different. The physical body has changed, but my direct experience tells me that I am still the same entity. So this is the part that we're adding. So last time we were only concentrating on what allows you to say that a certain entity, a certain being is the same. Here we're talking about your direct experience of yourself despite all the changes that are noticeable uh, physically. And you knowing uh, by experience, by direct experience in an immediate way without intermediary that you are still the same entity. Okay, so as opposed to, you know, the parts of your body that are changing. And so this becomes a second argument to prove the materiality of the soul. The third argument, and this one, you know, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. But this is a, it's kind of the, the type of argument that is uh, simple. It's, it's uh, powerful, but very simple. And so you have to understand it. If you talk about immaterial entities, they are not divisible you can only divide things that are material. Something that is non-material cannot be divided. And so if you look at yourself, if you look at your eye, the eye could never be divided. And this, this becomes a very, very important topic. This is something that we you know, discussed very, very quickly when we were talking about Tawheed, and we were talking about the difference between things that are material and things that are not. And we said that things that are material have extension, and therefore they may be divided, and in fact infinitely divided. The same thing can be said about the soul. And then when you add the fact that you are experiencing yourself, you're experiencing the soul, this I that you are, do you feel that it is only one, or do you feel that it can be split? And the truth is it cannot be split. You know you cannot be split. If you feel yourself here, you cannot be at the same time at another place or another uh, time right you can't be here and there you can't be here and there uh, in space and you cannot be here and there in time this is because you have a direct experience of yourself as one entity that cannot be divided and you know it, it kind of becomes uh, complex to say this if you think about it it's kind of impossible to try to imagine yourself feeling that you are two at the same time or more and this is further proof again direct experience immediate experience of yourself that you are immaterial because it cannot be divided. It cannot be split into parts. The last 
argument is kind of a derivative of this argument, which is the psychological states. And the psychological states of the eye. So all those things that we said we'd look at first. So, you know, your awareness, your, you, that you know that you have a will, that you know that you are thinking, you experience directly that you're thinking or you're doubting or you're willing something or that you exist. When you, took, when you take a look at all of these, you see that none of these have any of the attributes of the characteristics of matter. So again, they cannot be divided. So the experience of the I itself and the experience of the characteristics, which was argument three and argument four, of the characteristics of the I, the derivatives of the I are also immaterial. And so with these arguments, with these four arguments, the author tells us here, here are four different arguments to clearly establish in a way that no one could ever make you doubt and this is the power of this argument or these four arguments, is that you feel them directly. It's that this is not a theoretical exercise. Each one of these points, take it back, sit and think about it, and you'll see that the validity of this claim is established directly simply by understanding what it's saying. You understand that it's true because this is what you experience directly. Okay, it's like someone now co coming to you and telling you that you don't exist. No matter what they say, you know that in reality, what you're experiencing directly is that your own exist you exist, your own existence. So no matter what theoretical argument is presented, what you are experiencing directly is that you exist, right? And, uh, and so at the end of the fourth argument, uh, you know, the author tells us that uh, these different states or these different uh, derivatives of your I are also all non-material and therefore they are, in the terminology that we introduced last week, we said that they are therefore accidents of an immaterial essence. Accidents as in things that cannot exist in themselves. And the example that we gave I think was color. And so we said that, you know, a color does not exist in itself. There are things, you know, quality and quantity for instance, they don't exist in themselves. You need an essence on which to hold them on to, right? To host them and to, to carry them, to bring them into existence. And those essences cannot exist without the accidents either because we're in a material world and therefore it has to be uh, always limited by those things. In any case, so that's the relationship between accidents and essence. For, for those of you a little bit more interested in the, the, philosophical, the philosophical terminology for all of this. Okay, so in addition to everything that we said, and here the author does not, you know, get into any details very, very quickly. He tells us, in addition to this argumentation that we presented, there are other proofs that could easily be added to what we said to further establish that the soul is a material. So one of them is dreams and the entire world of dreams and everything related to dreams. And then communication with the deceased souls. So that's bec that becomes a second topic and it could actually, I would add, be combined with the first topic. So dreams in the sense that as people dream, and we're going to come back to that uh, towards the end of the lesson, inshallah, when we talk about what the Holy Quran says, the world of dreams basically could be inter uh, interpreted as, you know, your brain creating these images based on what you experience during the day or in your life and so on and so forth. And the entire theory between conscious and unconscious and subconscious and all of that. Or you could also say that you are actually experiencing things because your soul has access to another world as you are asleep. Okay, and so there are many, many experiments and many, you know, very well known uh, experiences that people have gone through. Many of you have maybe gone through similar things where you see things in your dream that are clearly from the past or the future. Uh, sometimes you combine to this the whole topic of premonition and so on and so forth. So that's in, it's in that sense, although it's not explained at all in the in the book. Uh, the second, as we said, is you know what he refers to as communicating with the souls of those who are deceased. And again, here I mean it could be the saints, it could be the imams, it could be uh, just normal entities, normal people that uh, we have come across. It could be family members. Uh, I mean, countless, countless stories are told about people who, uh, you know, someone who is deceased, they come and they visit people who are still in this world. Uh, and they tell them what has happened or they need things from them uh, and so on and so forth. And this exists in every culture and every 
time of humanity this has happened and will continue to happen. Okay, so these are indications that there might be something different than the body that exists uh, in the human being that is not material and that can continue to exist even though the body no longer exists. A third argument that can be added to here is that uh, what the some of the saints can actually accomplish. And these, you know, if you remember, we talked about this, we called them karamat. So these are the things that people who, you know, uh, purify themselves and work spiritually on themselves may sometimes accomplish, may be able to do, where you clearly see that what they are doing is not, cannot be explained simply by their physical body. There is something else at play that is allowing them to do the things that they are doing. And to this, we could easily add anything that actually falls. The, the, the author simply uh, mentions, you know, people who practice certain, certain things. And so I refer to them as yogis, for instance. But the, the truth is, there is a whole field right now, parapsychology, that is dedicated to trying to understand this mind over body phenomenon. And it can be things that we may consider extremely you know, scientific and, and material, but the truth is it's still a mind over body thing. So those who are studying, let's say, neuroplasticity uh, and the ability of the brain to regenerate itself, uh, and in those cases, in a lot of those cases, it's actually a mind over body uh, exercise. So that you're forcing, so what is forcing the brain? What is forcing, what is this mind? So this is the mind over matter, mind over the brain, that you're forcing the brain to do certain things uh, no, it's not itself forcing itself to do those things. There's something from the outside trying to do, make it do certain things, right? So this is a, anything that falls under the, the mind over matter. If you do a certain, you know, uh, extensive study, and so this is just me adding to this, uh, if you want to study the placebo effects. So the placebo effect cannot really be understood with a uh, purely materialistic understanding of the brain. Okay, if you think that something is going to work, it's enough to actually make it work. Or you think that it's not going to work, then it's not going to work. And the nocebo effect, which is the opposite. Okay, hypnosis. So the ability to hypnotize, to suggest to someone to the point where they are hypnotized. If you study, for instance, the entire field related to near-death experiences, and if you study the entire field related to uh, mystical experiences, so you know, these are three terms that are used sometimes interchangeably. There's spiritual experience, there's religious experience, and there's mystical experience. Let's just lump them up together. So all of these topics and subtopics and fields of research can further add evidence that there is definitely an immaterial soul. There is definitely a mind over body or mind over matter or mind over brain uh, dynamic going on taking place within us and that we could if we wanted to and if we understand it better we could definitely leverage it better in our lives okay so this is kind of the, the, that whole field now so this is the more rational uh, discussion related to the field and the uh, arguments related to to establishing the immateriality of the soul based on logic and based on your reasoning human reason now, if we go to the Holy Quran and we want to compare and we want to see what the Holy Quran says about this topic, so there are a lot of verses and we could put them, lump them together uh, in two big categories. There are verses of the Holy Quran, which we're not doing here, uh, but someone could do that. You could go through the verses of the Quran and find all the ones that directly talk about uh, human beings having a soul and then looking at the characteristics of that soul as they are described in, the whole, in those verses of the Quran. And those verses are explicit. They're, they're very open. Uh, you know, no matter how you interpret them, they're very clear that there is a soul, that it's immaterial, and that this is who you really are. Okay? So, and then you have other verses of the Quran that may not necessarily be talking about the soul as the main topic. They're not the topic of discussion in that soul is not of that verse is not necessarily the soul, but for that, when you understand what the verse is saying, you clearly need a soul for that verse to make sense. And so, this is more the indirect verses speaking about the soul, anyways. This is just something to keep in mind as you go through the verses of the Holy Quran. Some of the verses are presented here, so in the next verses, uh, the author tells us that here. Look, notice how the 
verses in the Quran are going to explicitly make it clear that a human being has a soul. And in a lot of these verses, you will notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes the soul to himself as though it is his soul, right? And this is a, you know, a big topic that, we, again, we don't have time to, to get into. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer certain entities to himself as though they are his? And so if you understand Tawheed and everything we said, then you also understand that basically everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Holy Quran is very clear in this. So why does he add in certain cases that these, there are many entities, for instance, at some point, you know, the Holy Quran talks about uh, uh, al kaaba for instance, being the house of God, my house. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Ibrahim alayhi salam and his son, وَطَحْكَرَ bayti. So when Ibrahim alayhi salam is supposed to purify this house, this house is being, being the Kaaba. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer to it as mine? What's the difference between this and something else? How is this more or less God's? So, you know, there's a lot of metaphorical ways to, to talk about this. But the bottom line is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran, when it refers something as being to God, it basically wants to highlight the importance, the status, the prestige, the special character of that thing. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make sure you understand that this is something special. This is not just like any other entity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. This is something different. It has to bring you back to Allah. It's a stronger sign that points to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is the same thing. Uh, the Holy Quran refers to certain days as ayyam Allah right? Or uh, there are, for instance, certain places, or there are certain people, kalimatuhu, about Isa alayhi salam, it says that he is his word, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so on and so forth. So the things that the Holy Quran refers to Allah directly, it's to show their prestige, their importance, their status, uh, and to the extent to which they can bring you back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're clearer signs maybe than other entities. And so when the Quran talks about the soul, your nafs, your ruh, it's talking about something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala often refers to himself. So look at these verses of the Quran. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his creation, about what he creates, he says, uh, so he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being who perfected everything he created and began the human's creation from clay. Then he made his progeny, so the progeny of a human being, the descendants of a human being, from an extraction of a lowly fluid. Then he proportioned him and he breathed into him of his spirit. So here there is something different happening to the human being from everything else that's described, which is the physical component and made for you hearing, the hearing, the sight and the hearts. How little do you give thanks? So here you see that when the Holy Quran talked about this, there's a component that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to himself to show you that there is a part of you that is much more special than the rest of you. And breathe into him of his spirit, okay? And another verse, and these are two verses of the Quran that, that say the exact same wording. So when I have proportioned him, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to the angels, asking them to bow down in prostration to Adam alayhi salam once he's been created. He tells them, so when I have proportioned him and breathed into him of my spirit, then fall down in prostration. When was Adam worthy of being an object of frustration for the angels. When that breathing of Allah's spirit into him took place, then that's when he became a full human being. And that's when he became worthy of that act from the angels. So this is who you truly are. As a human being, it's that spirit. It's not the body that is the instrument which is used by the spirit. More verses of the Quran. And here, notice how clearly the Quran establishes the difference between there is a body and then there is an immaterial soul that and that is who you really are that is how who we really are are all of us notice the first verse it says they say when we have been lost or when we have disappeared in the dust so Basically, those are the people who deny the afterlife. And they say when our bodies have completely decomposed in the ground, we've, we, we've died uh, and now our bodies have completely disappeared into the ground. Then they say when we have been lost or when we have disappeared in the dust, shall we be indeed created in you? Rather, they disbelieve in the encounter with their Lord. Say you will be taken back 
or you will be reclaimed by the angel of death, the one charged with you. Then you will be brought back to your Lord. So here notice how the verse says, you will be taken back. What will be taken back? The Quran is saying that the body is being decomposing, it's disappearing in the ground. So what is being taken back? Obviously there is something non-material that is completely different from the body that the angel of death who has been made in charge of you is taken back. Yatawaffa is to take back completely. The one who has been made in charge of you is taking you back, reclaiming you fully. Okay? So again, very clear that there is a part of you that is being taken back, but the Quran doesn't say it's a part of you. It says you are taken back. Yatawafakum. All of you is taken back, which means all of you is the immaterial component. The part of us, in fact, it becomes not a part. It becomes who we really are. That's the part that the angel takes. And the rest is the body that can decompose in the ground. And it doesn't make any difference to us and who we really are. And here, notice the next verse, it says, if you were to see, so notice again the same thing. If you were to see when the wrongdoers are in the throes of death and the angels extend their hands saying, give up your souls. This day shall you receive your reward, a punishment of humiliation for that which you used to attribute to Allah falsely and for being arrogant towards his signs. So here notice, for instance, how the verse says, give up your souls so this person is dying the verse says you know these people are in the process of dying in the throes of death and the angels they extend their hands and they say give up your soul so there is a part of them that the angels are taking back and then right away the angels say this is the day that you are going to receive the reward of your arrogance and it's going to be a punishment of humiliation so despite the fact that the body is dying and dead now, there is going to be something felt by you in terms of a punishment that you will understand as being a punishment and that you will feel humiliated, you will feel humiliation. Obviously the body is no longer uh, in the equation, which means that there's something that can feel the punishment and that can feel the humiliation. And this is the part that the angels are saying, give it up, give up your souls take out your own souls as they're saying in, in this verse and then another verse says and this is a, a you know there's a couple of verses in the quran that talk about this this is the more explicit one there's another one in surah al-an'am and there are maybe other ones too that can be used for this but notice this verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says allah takes back or reclaims allah takes back the souls at the moment of their death and those who have not died in their sleep. Now, this is a verse that, unfortunately, a lot of those who have translated this verse, I think they miss the manner in which, and this is, a, this is an art, and this is extremely important when you read the Holy Quran, to know how to put the words together to form the full meaning. The verse is saying, Allah yatawaffa al-anfusahina mawtiha, okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reclaims the souls at the time of their death, and those who have not died, and I've intentionally added a comma here, please notice the comma, and those who have not died in their sleep. So what happens in your sleep? What happens is the same thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reclaims the soul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reclaims the soul. Allah yatawaffa al-anfusahina mawtiha wallati lam tamut fi manamiha. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking back your soul when you die and when you go to sleep. Very clear, the verse is explicit. It doesn't need a lot of, you know, complex interpretation. And then the verse tells us what happens from that point on. You go to sleep or you die. Both cases, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reclaiming the soul. And then it says, then he retains those for whom he has ordained death. So in the cases in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that this person dies, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds that soul. So in both cases, he took the soul back. But if the person has died or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that this person dies, he just holds that soul back. As for the others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala releases that soul so that it goes back. And that's why the verse says, so then he retains those for whom he has ordained death 
and releases the others until a specified time. So basically whenever he wishes and decrees that that person's time of death will come, that's when he will hold back that soul. Until then, he will release it every time this person goes to sleep. He'll take it and release it. This gives us a completely different understanding of what sleep is, right? And this is why, notice how the verse says, there are indeed signs in that for a people who reflect. And this is incredibly important for us to understand how the Holy Quran uses and talks about sleep. Sleep is basically a miniature version of this big, complex, miraculous idea that we want to think about, which is the afterlife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically tells us, if you look at the world in which you live, if you look at this world all around you, this phenomenon of death and rebirth is taking place all the time, so that this may become a sign for you to understand how easy this is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if we tell you you're going to die and then you are going to come back to life in the afterlife and the hereafter, that there is an akhirah, there is a qiyamah, there is a judgment. And do not consider this something far-fetched or difficult to understand. You should be experiencing this all around you. And the verses of the Quran that insist, for instance, about looking at, you know, earth, looking at the barren land at the time when, let's say, it's dry. There is a there is no rain, there is no water, and you see that everything is dead. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and he will bring the water to it. And he suddenly you have a lush vegetation, that you have these plants that come to life, and there is water, and then the animals come. It's as if it came back to life. And then you wait for the cycle to happen again, and it dies again. Well, when you notice this, don't you see that this is a cycle of life and death, and that the cycle of life and death is supposed to be a miniature version of what we are presenting to you, this teaching about the afterlife. And then don't even, you don't even need to look that far out. Look at yourselves. You are actually dying every day, every single day. Every time you go to sleep, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking your soul back. And then he allows it to come back because he has not prescribed that this is your time of death yet. So in other words, if you understand what sleep is, on one side, it allows us to, to really appreciate the miraculousness and how the sleep itself is, is, a, is a door that opens to a completely hidden, unseen world. That's one. And on the other side, from a more akhlaqi, more spiritual perspective, remember that every time you're closing your eyes, you are actually dying. And that your final, the final time that you will close your eyes and the final time that you will take a breath in this world is no different than every time you go to sleep. There's no difference here. The only difference is in one case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing the body, uh, the, the soul to come back to the body. And in another case, he is not. He is holding it back. That's what Surah, Surah, uh, Surah uh, Zumar is saying here, 39, 42. That's exactly what it's saying. And there are many other verses in the Quran that talk about this. And this is one way to understand why the Qur'an insists and repeats always that sleep itself is a, is a miracle. It's a sign pointing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what's so special about sleep? Well, this is, in this verse, we get a glimpse of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that sleep is a miracle. That sleep is a sign pointing towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's something miraculous happening here every time you close your eyes to sleep and then you wake up again. Okay, so keeping all of this in mind, the conclusion for, for this lesson is that, first of all, I think inshallah it has become clear that there is a part of us, that there is a component in a human being that we can refer to as the soul that exists, one. And two, that this existence can also be independent of the body. Which means that even if the body were to die, that thing, that entity, can remain in existence. So one, it exists. Two, it can exist independently of the body. And three, that the identity of you as a human being, what, give, what brings you all together in all of your complexity, in all of your plurality, in all of your differences, what puts all of this together into one, into one I, and what says about you who you really are is that entity. It is not your body. 
It is that immaterial component that we refer to as the soul, that the verses of the Holy Quran say that this is what the angel of death is going to take back, to reclaim. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reclaims. That's who you really are, not this body. This body is the instrument that is given to you so that you, in, you can interact in this world with this world. Okay? And so I think with this, inshallah, that this is uh, a, a uh, generally speaking, a satisfactory, I'm not going to say it's an exhaustive, but it's a satisfactory presentation of the topic of the soul. Uh, and with this, inshallah, we are going to be ready to jump into, inshallah, the next time we meet, to jump into the topic of uh, the afterlife or the hereafter and start to establish the, the evidence for why do we say that there needs to be an afterlife. Okay, and there are uh, a number of proofs or arguments that we will be presenting then. Um, with this, uh, I'll stop here for today's lesson. There is a, a question that I think we have a little bit of time, so I'm going to take that question. Um, okay, so there's a second question. Um, let me look at the second question quickly. Okay, so the second question in general has to do with, let's say someone who becomes mentally ill, for instance. So in short, I'm not going to read the entire question. Uh, I understand what it says. So basically, we are basically saying that who we are, who we really are, is the soul. But the truth is, if we look at ourselves, we see that there's a body. And we can definitely feel and see that depending on the body you're in, depending on the faculties, the corporeal material faculties of that body, you are not going to be the same person. And you're not going to perform in the same way. And in certain cases, let's say you, you become ill or you have an accident and something happens and you're no longer able to think and so on and so forth. What happens in those cases? How can we say that who you truly, you truly are is the soul? And then depending on the illness or the accident that you may have, you may even be absolved and considered no longer responsible, even in a fiqhi sense, from uh, performing certain duties or considered you know, accountable or not for your actions and so on and so forth. So how do we consider all of this non-contradictory? In short, the answer to this is that while we are saying that who you truly are is the soul, the soul cannot do anything in this world so long as it is stuck in this body except through this body. So if you happen to have an instrument, your body, you happen to have an instrument that has become defective, either it was in the beginning or it becomes during, along the way, then of course that limits the ability of the soul. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this world and the manner in which we exist in it. And this is a very, very big topic that I cannot get into in detail right now. But basically, uh, it's the idea that when we enter into this world, our souls are like basically the other side of the coin. So imagine a coin, one side being your physical body, the other side being your soul. Both need each other. But it doesn't mean that who you are is the, uh, the, the physical component. For in order for the soul to progress and to mature and to evolve and to move towards its perfection or to complete itself and grow and develop, it requires the development of the body. And that's why we are told not to eat certain things and not to do certain things, although they may look like they're purely physical things. But those physical things have an impact on who you are. Islam will tell you how to sleep and when to sleep because it impacts how your body behaves and your soul needs this body to interact with this world. It's basically handicapped without this body. And so if you do anything to harm this body, then you are now stuck with a body that is no longer able to perform everything that it can or it could had it been in a uh, if that soul had been in a body that was fully able or more able than another. So of course, we are not neglecting at all that there is a physical component and that this is the instrument through which the soul interacts with this world. And in fact, it requires it for its own development. And if you have a, a defect, let's say with the brain or an illness that occurs or an accident that takes place, then suddenly that soul is no longer able to function in this world. That's what you know, the philosophical theory tells us about 
the relationship between the body and the soul. So none of this is to say that the body doesn't exist or that the body means nothing or that you are only the soul. What we have said is that what, who you truly are is your soul, but that you are stuck, and we haven't really talked about the body. Inshallah, we're going to come to it uh, when we're going to talk a little bit later. We're going to have a, a lot of chances to talk about this, inshallah. You are still stuck inside a body, and that body is your only instrument to go through this world, through this life. Okay? That's the first question. The second question is the one that we received, uh, I believe, uh, the last time. Um, and so here the question basically has to do with the topic of uh, reincarnation first. And then uh, with the, in there, there's a link between uh, the topic of uh, al-masq, as it's referred to in the Holy Quran, uh, and whether this is a form of reincarnation or not. So the question says there are some schools of thought that say that certain people uh, were given adab and they were turned into different creatures such as fish uh, without scales are considered as such so is this a form of reincarnation so long story short i'm going to put all of those you know schools of thought uh, aside allow me to talk a little bit about reincarnation first and then i'll talk about this topic of mesh the topic of reincarnation itself has existed for pretty much I'm not going to say for as long as humanity has existed, but it could be argued that it has. So it's basically one of the interpretations that humanity has come up with, one of the explanations that human beings have come up with to explain, to explain what happens after we die, to explain how the world works, to explain all sorts of things. If you go back to the monotheistic religions, they are all in agreement about the soul. They are all in agreement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the human being a body in which, you know, it, which is an instrument, but it's really the immaterial soul that is who you truly are. And so if you go to previous, you know, MBA and their scriptures, this is very clear. As opposed to this, and, and of course, inshallah, we're going to establish the proofs, the rational proofs for all of this more than what we have done already. But what, with what we have already presented, there is enough both rational and scriptural evidence of how the, 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 the soul works with the body, interacts with the body, that there is an immaterial soul that is associated with one body and that this, sees, this relationship ceases at the time of death and then the soul goes into basically, we can call it another realm or dimension, uh, awaiting the afterlife, okay? So that's kind of in general, that's, and, and we're gonna be explaining all of this a lot more uh, soon, inshallah. So as opposed to this, there is this other alternative explanation or interpretation of what's actually happening. And this is the idea of the reincarnation. And it's not all bad. Reincarnation, basically, the, the good part of it is that it recognizes, and we will come to that inshallah soon, it recognizes that it's impossible for this world to be in the state that it is, which is a world full of injustice, a world in which those who perform very, very bad deeds do not seem to get punished for them. And those who perform very, very good deeds do not seem to be rewarded for them. Be basically, that's what we notice when we look at human history, when we look at the state of the world we live in. And so if the world is just what we're considering, what we're seeing and what we're experiencing, then there's something really, really unjust about it. So one way to rectify this, besides you know what religion what religious uh, scriptures that we believe in are saying. An alternative to this is to say, so basically when you die, you are reincarnated based on how good or bad you were, you are reincarnated into another entity. And so if you did good, then you are reincarnated into something better. And if you do bad, then you are reincarnated into something of a lower form of life, lower level of life. and here is where you know there are differences so in certain cases and in certain philosophies they're going to say that this is going to go forever it just goes on and on and on infinitely like this in other cases it says no that this is only going to continue for as long as all of those entities need to go through this purification process and 
the end result in this is that, for instance, they reach this uh, state where they lose their individuality and they are uh, basically reunited with the main soul or the universe or, you know, the energy from which they initially came from. Okay, so it's a very pantheistic understanding of reincarnation and, and the world. So when you look at all of this, th this is kind of the, 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 the idea. This is how reincarnation is presented. So what's the issue with this? The first point, the first issue with this is that if you look at the manner in which the soul interacts with the body, you have to understand that the, it's like the world has, is following an arrow of time. You can never go back. You can never devolve. You're always moving in one direction. Okay? Some of our philosophers have given a name to this. They, re re they refer to it as al harak al jawhari They say that everything is moving towards a certain path, towards a certain end. Everything in existence, including the human being, but differently in the case of the human being because they have this free will. So their movement is a lot more free, but it's still a movement in one direction. It's everything is always moving in one direction. When you are born into this world and you know nothing, and then you learn and you evolve and you, you know, uh, develop and grow spiritually and you grow in your soul, basically that's what it is, until the moment you pass away, until the moment you die. Regardless of how much you grew, you moved in a certain direction. Philosophically, it's impossible for you to go back. Because you reached a certain level of maturity that cannot be brought back. You cannot reset that unless, you know, you mess up the order of the world. Okay? So that's one, let's refer to it as one philosophical argument against reincarnation. That's one. A second philosophical argument against reincarnation is that the manner in which souls interact and move and do anything in this world is through a body. But this also means that and, you know, extensive advanced works of philosophy have been written about this, is that you cannot have two souls acting on one body. You always only have one body for one soul and one soul for one body. In which case, it means that if you're saying that there is a reincarnation taking place, when that entity, that bodily entity, comes into existence, does it have a soul or not? If it already has a soul, then a second soul cannot come into it. And if it doesn't have a soul, then it was not alive in the first place. It was not a living entity. So that's considered kind of a second big argument against reincarnation from a philosophical point of view. Now, if you look at these notions of the reincarnation as we explained them, so for instance, for reincarnation to work, you either have to believe that the universe is infinite and this cycle repeats itself forever and ever and ever infinitely. Or you believe in something, let's say, like pantheism, which is where these souls are reuniting with the main soul, with the spirit, with the world spirit or spirit world or the energy or the cosmos or whatever you want to call it. And then you lose your individual instantiation and you become part of something much bigger. All of this philosophically is rejected. We don't have time to go through all of this. And so put out, putting aside all the philosophy behind it, it's also rejected religiously. So we cannot believe that there is no beginning and end to the world. In fact, everything points to there was a beginning and there was an end. This world has a creation and the creation was intended for a purpose and that will be the end of the world and, and, and. Okay? And we cannot accept either pantheism, which is this idea that there is one, let's say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as some want to believe, that God is the universe and the universe is God and it's one force and it could be love and it could be energy and it could be something else. And the souls are just kind of like smaller manifestations of this, but they go back to it at some point when they're ready. For instance, you know, this is the nirvana or this is however you want to understand your form of pantheism. And we even have Islamic philosophers who believed in this. Okay, but this is all going both against what philosophical doctrines and conclusions are going to lead to and clearly going against what the scripture says. Okay, so this is also something to keep in mind. And then if 
you know, if we want to add another layer to all of this, and I don't want to talk for too long, we're almost out of time. If we wanted to add another layer to this, and always, always keep this in mind, it's never really only about this component, but this component is always very important. Think about what potentially could it mean at a social level, at a political level, at a cultural level, when you have this kind of thinking. Basically, this is the kind of thinking that you would have in order to manipulate a society, in order to prove to those who have nothing that they were, it's all justified. If I have everything and I continue to have everything and I do as I please in this world, it's because I was so good in the previous world that I was reincarnated into a better state form here. And therefore, if you want to be truly religious, all you need to do on yourself is work yourself and try to become better, but never come after me. Don't fight the injustice. Don't do anything at the level of the social, the political, for instance. Work on yourself, concentrate on yourself so that you may be reincarnated in a higher form such as me. And that's why if you see in those societies, those who are the king, those who are you know, at the head of a dynasty or an empire, it's all considered as part of this you know, universal, I don't wanna say divine because it's not, God is not understood in this way. It's all part of this, uh, order of things where everything is justified all the injustice that you see all the problems that you see it's all justified and it all makes a lot of sense now we come to the topic at hand so once this topic is clear the topic of reincarnation is clear okay so reincarnation in philosophy is referred to as nesh okay nesh and nasikh wal mansukh one way to understand it in philosophy is basically referred to as reincarnation if you refer to the verses of the Holy Quran, there is a topic referred to as al-masq, which is not the same. Okay, al-nasq al basically is reincarnation. Al-masq are groups of people. So this is not schools of thought. Forget schools of thought. We are talking about the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran tells us Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says masakhum, qirada wa khanazir. He changed them into apes and pigs. So in those cases, are we talking about some sort of reincarnation? No. What happened to those people, especially if you go back to the Ruwayat, those people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them. And even if you say so, some scholars say that they were not actually externally modified into that form, those animals, only internally. So, you know, in, uh, in how they felt about themselves. But it seems that if you go to enough Ruwayat and you see what they say, it says that their bodies were changed. And this was their torture, that you suddenly realize that you are no longer a human being. You acted like a, a monkey or an ape for so long, arrogantly against Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transformed you into this in this world. He transformed you into the pig that you have been acting like all along. He made you into this in this world to make you taste the punishment and the humiliation in this world. And this is what will await you in the afterlife too. And this is what, if you go back to some of the uh, narrations that we have about what happens to people in the afterlife is that they take their external their the external shape that you have will become your reality that will make that will match who you truly are internally if your faculties match that of the faculties of a monkey or a pig that's how you will be resurrected in the afterlife okay that's in short but in the ruwayat we're not told that those people let's say became like you know empires and they lived for uh, eons, not at all. In the Ruwayat, we're told that this happened and they, they were all killed in three days. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transformed them and this punishment lasted for three days and then they were basically extinct as people, never to be seen or heard from again and no more progeny to be continuing in, in, in humanity afterwards. Now, if there are schools of thought that, you know, this is the, the adab that is mentioned in the Quran. Anything besides that, could be kind of myth and superstition and uh, you know all sorts of ideas that people uh, can make up. Uh, that's I think all for the questions that we had. Inshallah it was uh, useful and beneficial and uh, we meet again inshallah next time when, when we will enter into the topic of the afterlife and the arguments we have for its necessity and uh, its possibility.